Ballinger joins us this morning. Thank you very much, Pierre, for being with us. Good morning. Good morning to you. Um, it is said that uh, John Kennedy was the first president to allow televised news conferences. What kind of preparation did you go through since you were really pace setters in that? Well, we had a very, uh, actually, a rather complex method of preparing for press conferences. The day before, I would hold a meeting with all the press officers of all the departments in the government. We would draw up a list of questions, maybe 100 questions. And the day of the press conference, we would have breakfast with the president, which included Secretary Rusk and Secretary McNamara and other White House staffers. And I would sit opposite the president, and I would ask him this list of 100 questions. I would try to phrase the questions in the way the press normally ask questions. And we'd go through it, and some of them he'd say, OK, I can handle that, I can handle it. Other words, we had discussions around the table. And at the end of the meeting, we usually had five or six subjects that he wanted more briefing on, and we would spend the rest of the morning getting briefing papers prepared. Uh, which I would bring to him in the early afternoon before he went to the State Department Auditorium for the press conference. I would say we were able to predict about 90% of the questions that were asked of the president. Well, it's also said that he had a rapport with the press unlike any other modern-day president. Why do you suppose that was true? Well, I think, first of all, he was a former newsman himself. He understood what uh, journalism was all about. He also fundamentally understood the relationship between the government and the press, which I think some of the subsequent presidents did not. For example, Lyndon Johnson Richard Nixon uh, had very difficult times with the press because they did not understand uh, that there is uh, a built into the Constitution of the United States and the First Amendment uh, a not a conflict but certainly an opposing view of, uh, of what uh, is news. I mean, the government uh, tries to protect what it believes to be its own security. The press is interested in getting whatever information it can. That conflict exists and then will always exist. The second thing is that the relationship between the government and the press, particularly the White House and the press, has been considerably politicized uh, since John Kennedy was president. I mean, the events of uh, wa uh, Watergate, uh, the Vietnam War, have created a, a kind of an aura of hostility at the White House, which did not exist at the time John Kennedy was there. Do you suppose that's why more reporters attended his conferences than, than any other since? Well, I mean, uh, of course, it was new at the time. There had never been direct live televised broadcasts, and the decision to do that uh, was a, a consequence of uh, what we perceived as a success that John Kennedy had in his television debates with Richard Nixon. I fundamentally believe that those four debates uh, contributed uh, uh, significantly to John Kennedy's victory in 1960. And our feeling was that uh, he was a great communicator and it was important for us to go directly to the people uh, and let them make their own judgments about his press conferences rather than have them filtered through various news organizations. Well, his communication also included a wonderful wit that we all grew so to love, and he even used it in describing his young press secretary. Watch this. Uh, <laughs> Congressman Alger of Texas today criticized uh, Mr. Salinger as a, quote, young and inexperienced White House publicity man, end quote. <laughs> <laughs> I question the advisability of having him visit the Soviet Union. I wonder if you have any comments. I know there are always some people who feel that the Americans are always uh, young and inexperienced and foreigners are always uh, able and tough and great negotiators, but I don't think that the United States acquired its present position of leadership uh, in the free world uh, if that uh, view were correct. Now, he also, as I saw the press, said that Mr. Salinger's main job was to uh, increase uh, my standing in the Gallup poll. Having done that, he's now moving on uh, to... Uh, <laughs> Pierre, your reaction to that? Well, I think that was one of the most endearing things about John Kennedy. He had a marvelous sense of humor. Much, much of it, however, was self-deprecating. In other words, he didn't exercise his humor on other people, but on himself. Uh, and. Uh, you know, in dealing with him, uh, even in the most tense moments, he had a way of uh, breaking that tenseness with a, uh, with a little phrase or a joke. Uh, uh, and and it, it, that was one of the things that made him so easy to work with. You've often said that you think that the back door to the White House was more accessible than the front door. What does that mean? Well, I mean, what it means is that uh, President Kennedy was willing to see a lot of different people. And uh, I never uh, imposed any kind of policy that uh, reporters could only see them uh, if they went through me. And people like Arthur Schlesinger or Ted Sorensen or others in the White House often brought in 
uh, reporters that they wanted to, to, to see the president uh, without uh, consulting with me, which I didn't consider a problem because if the president wanted to see him, that was all right with me. Well, it's also uh, said that uh, that Jack Kennedy, uh, and it's quoted actually, he said that the presidency was uh, the vital center of action. I wonder if that filtered through to you when you were going around the campaign trail and all of that, those memories that you have. Well, when you say the vital cent center of action, I mean, the reason John Kennedy ran for president in the first place was he believed uh, fundamentally that man can do something about the destiny of his own nation and he perceived uh, and understood that the presidency was the place the ultimate place where you could do something about the United States and that's why he wanted to be president uh, the thing that impressed me about the campaign was that he was a man who could speak to people and engage them in what he was talking about and as president and I don't think that really very many people since then have engaged the American people in the feeling that they were part of the government, participating in government, uh, and not just being talked down to by government. That quote, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you, what you can do for your country, came from his heart then, didn't it? It did come from his heart and from his basic philosophy. I have another quote from June 1961. The president said, and I quote, I'm so close to Pierre and Ted and Kenny O'Donnell and Larry O'Brien and some of the others here that I consider them members of my family. Do you know what I think of Pierre? In 1968, I'm going to buy a newspaper and I'm going to be its publisher and Pierre is going to be its fat editor. <laughs> now let's make sure that that piece of news doesn't leak out. Do you remember that? Oh, I remember it very well because, you know, here we were uh, with the youngest president in the United States and uh, absolutely confident he was going to serve eight years, uh, but knowing that at the end of eight years he'd only be 51 years old and former president of the United States. And so we did have conversations from time to time. What do you do when you're an ex-president and you're 51? And John Kennedy wanted to keep on communicating with the American people, and one of his ideas was, uh, just as you have said, uh, to buy himself a newspaper and occasionally speak out in that newspaper. The day after the assassination, you had the most difficult task of uh, scheduling dignitaries. And it is reported that you were talking about JFK as though he was still there. Were you, were you feeling that? Well, it I mean, I had a very, very difficult time accepting the fact that John Kennedy was dead. Uh, in fact, uh, as you know, I was on an airplane on my way to Japan when the assassination took place. I got back to the White House in the middle of the night, uh, attended the, the religious services in the East Room, slept that night in the White House at the invitation of Mrs. Kennedy. Uh, and when I was aw awakened uh, out of a very sound sleep at 7 o'clock in the morning, I heard the operator say, Mr. Salinger, the president is calling. And in that instant, I... I suddenly felt that I had gone through a terrible nightmare about John Kennedy's death, and then I heard this voice say, Pierre, this is Lyndon Johnson, which was the first time that I began to accept that John Kennedy was dead. But in the ensuing days, uh, the job of press secretary was both the job of press secretary to a dead president and a live president. Mm. And my press conferences were divided between talking about the funeral arrangements on one side and what the new president was doing on the other. You know, it's interesting. All of us felt such an incredible sense of loss. As you well know, not a day goes by that people don't ask you about Jack Kennedy. But your I've sense... I've not had a day. You haven't. Your sense of loss must have been... I mean, none of us really knew what was going on inside the White House, and it must have been quite a struggle for all of you. Well, you know, and it was also compounded by sitting in my office and watching television. As you know, television was incessant during that period of time, and suddenly peering at the screen and seeing Lee Harvey Oswald get killed by Jack Ruby... I mean, the whole, the, the whole experience was shattering, and, and even 20 years later, sitting here talking to you, uh, those memories well up in my mind. Well, they're welling up for all of us on this day, and we thank you so much for sharing your memories. You were very important to him and, and important to us in the fact that you can share with us. Thank you very much, Pierre Salinger. Thank you for inviting me.